Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Father Ed Meeks, welcoming you to episode 14 of this apologetics podcast series entitled, You Can Go Home Again. Those of you who are regular viewers are aware that we are currently in the midst of a series of teachings on the Marian doctrines of the Church. Today, we will be looking at the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. But before we begin, I would like to offer a word of encouragement to any Protestant brothers and sisters who may be viewing. If you find yourself having difficulty in accepting the truth of these Marian doctrines, I encourage you to first go back and listen or re-listen to three specific prior podcasts in this series. Namely, episode 3 on Sola Scriptura, episode 4 on Apostolic Authority, and episode 12 on Marian Devotion. Those three, I believe, will provide a sound foundation for understanding and hopefully embracing all of the Church's teachings on Mary. So let's look today at the third of the four major doctrines of the Church regarding Mary, the mother of Jesus, namely the Immaculate Conception, a doctrine that was promulgated by Pope St. Pius IX in 1854. Now, before I go on, let me comment on the issue of the dating of this doctrine. One of the objections people sometimes raise about a Catholic doctrine is that it was promulgated relatively recently, in this case, 1,800 years after the Church was founded. The objection is that because of that late date, it appears to have invented out of whole cloth. In response to that objection, I would refer you to St. John Henry Newman's classic work on the development of doctrine, in which he explains that frequently a truth that the Church has always believed, professed, and taught can, at a point in time, be declared dogmatic, that is, become a doctrine, in order to emphasize both its necessity and its importance. Now, I don't have time to go deeper into this principle right now, but if you would like to read an excellent synopsis of Newman's teaching on this subject, I would direct you to the website entitled simplycatholic.com, simplycatholic.com, where you can then enter the search for the development of doctrine. Okay, on to the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. To begin with, the mystery of the Incarnation, the great truth of the Word made flesh contains within it any number of other truths <clears throat> excuse me, that point us to the all-encompassing grace and goodness of God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states in paragraph 487, as I mentioned previously, the following, quote, What the Catholic faith believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ and what it teaches about Mary illumines in turn its faith in Christ, end quote. This is the guiding principle behind all of the Church's doctrines and teachings regarding the Blessed Mother, and the Immaculate Conception is no exception. Now, as we begin to consider this, let's dispel a widespread misunderstanding concerning this doctrine which unfortunately even many Catholics hold to. A lot of people believe that the Immaculate Conception is a synonym for the virgin birth, that is, the virgin birth of Jesus. It is not. The two, that is, the Immaculate Conception and the virgin birth, those two doctrines, though closely interrelated, are separate and distinct truths. The doctrine of the virgin birth relates directly to the circumstances of Jesus' conception, namely that he did not have a human father, but was conceived in Mary's virginal womb by the power of the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, on the other hand, relates to the way Mary herself was conceived 
in her mother's womb, <clears throat> namely without original sin. Mary's Immaculate Conception was one of the things that set the stage for Jesus' virgin birth, but again, it is a separate and distinct truth. Mary had a human mother and a human father. The church tells us that their names were Anne and Joachim, both saints of the church. But unlike all the rest of us with human parents, Mary did not receive the transmission of original sin, the sin of Adam and Eve, from her parents. Here's how Pope St. Pius IX stated the doctrine, quote, The Most Holy Virgin Mary was, in the first moment of her conception, by a unique grace and privilege of Almighty God, and in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of mankind, preserved free from all stain of original sin. End quote. When the angel Gabriel greeted Mary as, quote, full of grace, the term which St. Luke uses in his gospel, translated as full of grace, is a past perfect participle of a Greek verb meaning literally, you who have been filled with grace, indicating a past action that is still in effect at the time of the speaking. In other words, at the time of the Annunciation, at the time of Gabriel's announcement to Mary, Mary was already full of grace. Now, as we look at this, let's remind ourselves of one important principle of God's will. The principle is that when God calls someone, anyone, for some special role or work in his kingdom, he always equips that person with everything he or she needs to carry out that role and work. He called Mary to the loftiest role any human being was ever called to, and thus equipped her in a special way that no human being before or since has been equipped. He filled her to the full with his grace, his redeeming, saving, sanctifying grace. He preserved her from original sin and from its effects. And the church teaches that he did so from the moment of her conception in the womb of her mother in order to make her a fitting vessel for her son. Actually, I should make a clarification here. Apart from Mary, there were actually two other people created without original sin, Adam and Eve. And remember, the church refers to Mary as the new Eve. Now, part of the implication of this is because Mary was conceived without original sin and its effects, she therefore did not have a sin nature. The result was that <clears throat> she was free as well from all personal sin during her lifetime. She could have sinned, she had a free will, but she did not. Now at this point, many non-Catholic Christians will raise an objection. The objection is this. How can you say that when Saint how can you say that when Saint Paul clearly states in Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That sounds pretty inclusive, doesn't it? And some would say it contradicts the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. My response to that is, what if I could show you a few other verses in the New Testament where the writer uses the same word, all, pantes in the original Greek, where it clearly does not mean literally all without exception. As an example, in 1 Corinthians 15.22, St. Paul wrote this, quote, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, there are a couple of things we need to say about this verse. When St. Paul says, In Adam all die, he is making a general observation about the sin of Adam bringing death, both physical death and spiritual death, to the whole human race. So this applies to the vast majority of mankind. Virtually all people, all people eventually die. 
but we know from Scripture that there were exceptions. The biblical record in Genesis 5.24 and in 2 Kings 2.11 and in Hebrews 11.5 tells us clearly that Enoch and Elijah did not die, but were simply taken up by God. <clears throat> Again, the second half of 1 Corinthians 15.22 says, In Christ all shall be made alive. If we take that literally, then we also need to be prepared to say that there is no reason for the existence of hell. If all shall be made alive spiritually in Christ. But we know, we know intuitively, that not literally all have been made alive in Christ. Now, there are other biblical examples where all does not mean literally all without exception, but I think you get the point. All have sinned is a general, nearly universal principle, but God can and did make an exception with Mary because the entire incarnation was in itself a mind-boggling exception. Some non-Catholic Christians will also object that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception implies that Mary did not need a Savior. And yet, she herself in her Magnificat says, quote, My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. The fact is, Mary did need a Savior, and in fact, the grace and favor and sinless state into which she was conceived and born were, as the doctrine states, applied to her, quote, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of mankind. They were given to her, in other words, as part of the fruit of Christ's atoning work on the cross. Now, how does that work? Since we know, obviously, that Mary was conceived decades before Jesus' atoning sacrifice at Calvary. The answer is that God is not bound by our sense of time. That's why, for example, we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 8, that Jesus is the Lamb, notice what it says, slain from the foundation of the world, from the foundation of the world. We know historically that Jesus died 2,000 years ago. But again, it says he was slain from the foundation of the world. And so the merit of Jesus' sacrificial death was applied to Mary preemptively, in advance. A good way to understand it is in the scriptural analysis of the deadliness of sin being a pit. The grace of God, won by Jesus on the cross, saves us by pulling us up out of that pit of sin. That same grace of God saved Mary by preventing her from ever falling into the pit. The point in time when Mary received that grace was again at the moment of her conception in her mother's womb. The truth is, the state into which Mary was conceived and born was the state that God originally intended for all human beings, the state in which Adam and Eve were created, but the state which was spoiled by their sin. And so when we understand the truth that Mary's role as the new Eve was to undo the damage done by Eve, Mary's saying yes to God, canceling out Eve's no, would it not make sense that God would preserve Mary free from original sin, the sin of Adam and Eve, from her conception? And when we understand that original sin is passed on to us as part of our human nature, would it not make sense that the sinless Jesus would receive his human nature from a sinless mother? By the way, getting back to the words used by the angel Gabriel when he first addressed Mary in her home in Nazareth, addressing her as full of grace. Are you aware that there's only one other place in all of the Bible where the phrase full of grace is used? It appears in St. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, referring to Jesus himself. Here's what John says, quote, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, end quote. 
And so Jesus, the one who by nature was full of grace, was born of a woman who by Jesus' merits was also full of grace. So allow me now to conclude by reading a few quotes from the early church fathers writing on this subject centuries before the doctrine was ever ever promulgated and which serves as evidence of the fact that the church believed this to be true from the very beginning, even well before Pope Pius declared it to be a doctrine in 1854. The first is by St. Ephraim, who lived from 306 to 373 A.D. St. Ephraim was a prominent father and doctor of the early church, living and ministering in Syria. Here's what he wrote, quote, You, Christ alone, and your mother are more beautiful than any others, for, for there is no blemish in you, nor any stains upon our mother. Who of my children can compare in beauty to these? End quote. Next, we hear these words from St. Ambrose, who lived from 340 to 397 A.D., another important father and doctor of the church. St. Ambrose was actually instrumental in the conversion of St. Augustine. In his commentary on Psalm 118, St. Ambrose writes this, quote, Lift me not up from Sarah, but from Mary, a virgin not only undefiled, but a virgin whom grace has made inviolate, free from every stain of sin, End quote. And then this from St. Augustine himself. Most Protestants have a great respect for St. Augustine, whom many consider the greatest of the Church Fathers. In his work entitled Nature and Grace, which he wrote in 415 A.D., Augustine wrote this, quote, Having made an exception of the Holy Virgin Mary, concerning whom, on account of the honor of the Lord, I wish to have absolutely no question when treating of sins, For how do we know what abundance of grace for the total overcoming of sin was conferred upon her who merited to conceive and bear him in whom there was no sin? And then finally, this from contemporary Catholic author Alan Schreck, writing in his book entitled Catholic and Christian. Quote. It seemed impossible to the early Christians that the all-holy God, whose very nature is opposed to sin, could have been born to someone bound by the sin and rebellion of the fallen human condition. How could Mary have been a sinner and still have carried the fullness of the all-holy God in her womb? The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, Shrek writes, is more of a statement about Jesus than about Mary. It proclaims that Jesus was someone so unique and so holy that God would even prepare his mother for his birth by preserving her from sin. End quote. Next week, we will be taking a look at the fourth of the great Marian doctrines, namely the doctrine of Mary's assumption into heaven. Until then, if you are enjoying these podcasts, Please like, share, and subscribe. And now, let us conclude with God's blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forever. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.